or well, welcome to you all again, especially those visitors amongst us. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love and dying. Once again this evening, we have the pleasure of the ministry of our brother, the Reverend Dr. Robert Lethem, uh, while, our Mr., while Mr. John McCabe ministers at Bethel this evening. Wednesday at 7 p.m. is a fellowship evening. Thursday from 6.30 is the summer work party. And then next Sunday the 20th, 10.30 in the morning, 5.30 in the evening, our brother Reverend Dr. Robert Lethem will again minister to us, while the Reverend Philip Haynes will be at, will be at Christ Church for the morning service. Reminder that we don't have pre-service prayer meetings in August, but one change for next Sunday is that fellowship will not be in the morning, it'll be in the evening. If next Sunday is the last occasion that our brother is with us, it's much easier for him to attend fellowship with Joan in the evening, so we'll have that time of fellowship next Sunday evening. Thank you, Alan, and I'm sure we'll look forward to that. Um, let us um, hear the words of the call to worship and prayer. Oh God, our Father, we th give thanks to you for the freedom which we have to approach you through Jesus Christ, your Son, and for the freedom to meet together unhindered by governmental authorities or other outside pressures. We pray that you would help us in our worship, teach us from your word, meet with us by your spirit, and grant us that we might grow in faith and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. We sing the first hymn, which is uh, on the second sheet of your uh, handout, your service sheet, a hymn addressed to God the Trinity. Father, most holy, merciful and loving, Jesus, Redeemer, ever to be worshipped, life-giving Spirit, Comforter, most gracious, God everlasting.
we turn back to the first page of the service sheet for the reading which comes from John chapter 1. Notice as we begin the similarity in, at the start between John 1 and Genesis 1, which we considered this morning. And that, in fact, is, uh, it's not incidental. It, John 1 is, is really grounded in part upon the first chapter of Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. But there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness, to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You'll note there in the reading, um, it appears very clearly that John, the author, is making a clear cut distinction between Jesus and John the Baptist. Now there are good reasons for that. There were a, a number of uh, incidents where there were disciples of John the Baptist who were causing some degree of problems for the early church. Uh, you read about this in Acts, for example, and in other Gospels. There's this contrast between uh, John the Baptist, whose ministry was effectively powerless, he was baptizing with water for uh, forgiveness of sins, and Jesus, whose baptism was with water and the Spirit, with, with power. So there's, there's that kind of contrast to it. And note also the, um, the, re the reflection on Genesis 1, not only creation, all things were made by him, but this contrast between light and darkness. The light shines in the darkness, verse 5. Uh, John the Baptist was not the light. The Word, who became flesh, he is the true light. We've got that, that kind of background to Genesis 1, and we'll see something of that, I think, both this week and indeed next. Let us all join together, firstly, in prayer, and then we say together and pray together the words of the Lord's Prayer. O God, our Father, we give thanks to you that though this world, ourselves having been included, walk in darkness, 
you have shone upon us with the light of the knowledge of, the, of your glory through Jesus Christ, your Son. But even as you said, let light shine out of darkness, you have shone in our hearts to give that knowledge. We thank you that you have brought us to faith. We thank you for your promises in your word. We thank you that you have committed yourself to us, to your people, now and forever, saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We thank you that our sins have been removed far from us as the east is from the west, that we have been received as your own children and enabled with confident faith or weak faith to look to the future, uh, to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the consummation of our salvation, and in the meantime, uh, to know that in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in life, that you are there uh, to lead us, to guide us, empower us, and protect us. We pray for your church throughout the world. We pray for all who are proclaiming your gospel today. We think particularly this evening of John McCabe, that you would bless his ministry. And we pray particularly too for all who are preaching faithfully in congregations where your gospel is faithfully believed and taught, that you would encourage all who are there, build them up in their faith, extend your kingdom, bring others to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, raise up many to preach and teach in the coming days, and strengthen your church throughout this land and indeed throughout the world. We pray for wisdom for our rulers, that they may guide us wisely and that they would seek to, uh, to conduct the affairs of state and the policies which they implement uh, in accordance with principles laid down in your word in conformity to your holy law that you would raise into positions of influence and power and authority those who will seek such things and have the gifts necessary for that task. We pray that in the trouble spots of the world, peace and justice may be brought to bear thinking particularly of the circumstances in Ukraine. We pray that the policies of violence may be overthrown. We pray that a regime may be introduced in Russia which will be just and wise. We pray that you would grant that where your church is persecuted in so many different countries and in uh, such a wide variety of ways that you would grant faithfulness and perseverance to your people, that they may respond with love and grace uh, to the attacks and opposition of those who wish to overthrow them. Help, we pray, all who are in need and particularly, we bring before you again those for whom we prayed this morning, asking for your mercy and grace and assistance, particularly for Kerry, uh, for Ron's uh, brother, and for Esperanza, and for others too known to us. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord thanking you that you are more ready to hear than we are to pray and are ready to send grace and mercy to help in time of need. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We sing the second hymn. I think this was originally attributed to Milton. Let us with a gladsome mind praise the Lord, for he is kind. Manchester City have just started talking to Jesus. Manchester City have just begun talks with Jesus. That was a headline I read just over a year ago, and I thought to myself, wow, it sounds like a revival is taking place. <laughs> and then I realized that, in fact, what was happening was that they had started contractual talks with their then player, Gabriel Jesus, which didn't go too well because he moved on, sadly, to <coughs> Arsenal. Um, it just shows how careful you have to be in understanding something that is written. It may not uh, ha appear uh, what it is at first sight. Uh, you have to ask what is in being intended to be conveyed by this statement. What is the intention of the author and what is the context in which it is given? And that, of course, applies also to the Bible. We have to ask those questions too, and particularly as we reflected this morning on the first chapter of Genesis. For those of you who weren't here, 
I decided to uh, give a few series, uh, a few sermons on Genesis 1 today and next week. And we had a general survey this morning in which we reflected that um, Genesis has to be interpreted just like any other book in the Bible in the context of the whole of Scripture. If we want to uh, uh, consider what James has to say, that we are justified by works, we, we need to interpret that statement in the light of the whole teaching of the Bible and not simply taken out of James chapter 2 without any remainder. Uh, and also we need to pay attention to the type of literature it is. For example, there's no point you uh, opening your car manual uh, and thinking it is a poetry. You won't get very far if that's the case. Nor are you going to make much progress if you read Shakespeare and think it's a direction on how to, uh, how to operate your vehicle. No, they're two quite different forms of literature. You have to take them in those terms. We reflected, too, that the first chapter of Genesis is a partial account. It's, a, it's not a complete account of creation. There's nothing in there about the creation of the angels. The stars, the planets, are there only incidentally. It's a, a document which was produced in the context of Israel's relationship to Yahweh, their God. The God. And it reflects the covenant which God had made with Israel. And it points forward, ultimately, to realities which are to come later. And we'll have more to say about that next week. It tells us that the God of Israel, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is the creator of the entire universe. Unlike the so-called gods of the ancient world who operated according to their devotees simply in their own territory. The God of Israel, the God who created all things, is sovereign over the entire universe. He has brought all other entities into existence by his own will, sovereignly, and he upholds and sustains and directs them to the end to which he has planned. And for a variety of reasons, we saw that Genesis 1 is heavily weighted in that last section on the sixth and seventh days. Now, today, or this evening, should I say, we're going to focus upon the most prominent point of Genesis 1, the word which comes up most frequently and thus can be seen as the, the subject of the whole, and that is God. The word God is the most prominent here in the first chapter of Genesis. God is the creator of the universe. He is the actor, the one who is operative throughout this uh, chapter, and he is the one who at the climax at the culmination of creation, is said to rest from his labors, seeing that all is good, in a mode which is represented as not having come to an end, but one which stretches out into the endless vistas of eternity, into which Jesus himself invites us to enter and to participate when he says, Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The fact that he is the one who can give us rest indicates that he is one with God. And so we'll focus on a number of aspects here in the first chapter of Genesis which direct us to something of what God is like. Firstly, God and order. The chapter, Genesis 1, is an account of an orderly process and progress from our standpoint. As far as we can understand it, 
and as far as it is presented to us, for surely the reality far transcends uh, what we are capable of, of, uh, of measuring, there is progression in a settled order leading to the uh, destination which God has intended for it. Let's remind ourselves of verse 2. How inhospitable the earth was when brought into existence. The earth was without form. It was just shapeless. It was void, empty. There was no life there. It was lifeless, shapeless, and formless. It was utterly dark. There was no light. It was pitch black. It's like a horror movie. Total darkness. Just think if you're in, uh, uh, inside of an evening in a big building like this or much bigger and it's dark outside and the lights go out and it's pitch black. It would be horrific. How many times have you woken up suddenly, unexpectedly? And it's similar to that. It's, it's not a pleasant experience. But this, there was no relief from it. At least in a building you can switch the lights on. Or you can wait till day dawns. But here it was utterly dark. It was totally in, inhospitable, inhospitable to human existence or to the existence of virtually everything else, any other organic uh, or, sen uh, or sentient being. And moreover, it was wet. It was entirely covered by ocean. Darkness was over the face of the deep. We wouldn't be able to exist there. In other words, the earth when created, when brought into existence, was a bleak, and a grim place on which you and I could not possibly live. Now, Genesis also informs us that God was there. The Spirit of God was brooding over the face of the waters. So dark, bleak, and inhospitable as though that scene was, Nevertheless, there was one hugely compensating factor. If anybody could even be there to be compensated, which they couldn't, but God was there. The Spirit of God was in charge. This was not chaos. This was not outside God's control. This was entirely according to his purpose. He was in charge. He was in authority. He was there. It was part of his plan. And bit by bit, this chapter shows us how God was at work bringing the earth into a condition which was suitable for man, and for, for humans uh, to live. A situation in which they could then be formed and which they could then be enabled to occupy. Firstly, the darkness. In day one, verses three to five, God says, let there be light, and there was light. And God separated the light from the darkness, he called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the darkness was no longer pervasive. God had create, brought into existence light, in a way which we can't explain, and we don't know, uh, but he had brought it light into existence as one of the prerequisites for human living. We need light in order to be there and to live. <coughs> then, in uh, the second day, he creates an expanse in the midst of the waters. He separates the waters. Remember, the earth was entirely wet. And now the waters are separated. The waters above the expanse and the waters below the expanse. And in the middle, there's the expanse. So God is in the pro at work in the process 
of bringing some kind of form to the earth and in preparing the way for further development which is going to take place uh, on the third day. Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. So now the earth is not only uh, no longer entirely dark, but nor, no longer either is it pervasively covered with water. There's dry land and there's light. So the earth is no longer, uh, no longer does darkness brood over the face of the deep. But next, it begins, God begins to populate it. Firstly, in the third day, with vegetation, with plants, fruit trees, all of their own kind, uh, bet trees bearing fruit, and so on. There's vegetation. Uh, then, on days four, there's the creation of lights in the expanse of the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars. And then the waters swarm with living creatures on the fifth day, birds great sea creatures, every living creature that moves, winged birds, creeping things, reptiles, fish, birds. It's becoming populated. It's no longer empty. And then finally, on day six, there's the formation of land animals. And now we're in a situation where the earth is ready and prepared for the big event which we remarked on earlier today, the creation of humans in the image of God. And to be like God on a finite level in a way which we'll explore next Sunday. In other words, God operates in an orderly, progressive fashion. He works according to his plan. He plans and he fulfills that plan. His purposes are worked out. As the hymn goes, God is working his purpose out as year succeeds to year. So that indeed the time is drawing near when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of his glory as the waters cover the sea. His purposes are true, his word is sure, he is faithful, he's orderly, he progress, he, 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 he full, work which he begins, he brings to perfection, he brings to completion, not only the creation of the earth, but ourselves too, as Paul says. A work he's begun in you, he will bring to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And the world around us and the universe, the solar system, the galaxies, down to the smallest, minute, microscopic organisms are evidence of that fact. Quite apart from his covenant through his son Jesus Christ, which even more so demonstrates it. Now is this process, creation, as some have argued, the answer to that I'd suggest is no, it is not. The church has traditionally and rightly understood creation to be ex nihilo, out of nothing. Well, that is to say, not out of something which is nothing, as if there's some entity called, which we call nothing. No, no, there's nothing there. There is simply God. And he brought the universe into existence, an existence which it did not have, which he made for it. And that is clearly stated in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now some have argued that that is a description, a heading for all that follows, and therefore embraces the con uh, result. But in fact that is not the case, in, I would suggest. Genesis is divided actually into a number of sections uh, listing um, and each of those sections are phrased and presented in a quite different way. So, for example, chapter 2, verse 4, these are the generations of the heavens and earth. 
when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. Chapter 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Chapter 10, verse 1. These are the generations of the sons of Noah. Chapter 11, verse 10. These are the generations of Shem. Chapter 11, verse 27. These are the generations of Terah. And in chapter 36, these are the generations of Esau. They demarcate various sections of Genesis. It's expressed in a quite different way than that first verse, which I would uh, suggest to you refers to that, that, that initial creation. That, in fact, is the traditional way in which Genesis 1 has been understood. The traditional view of Genesis 1 is best expressed by people like Augustine or, in the 13th century, Robert Gross Tester, Bishop of Lincoln, who wrote a massive book on the six days of creation, and by Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologia, in which Genesis, verse 1 refers to creation, and then the rest of the chapter to formation and adornment. The way that that initial creation was formed and shaped, and then in which it was adorned by various elements. In which case, most of this chapter refers not so much to creation as to providence, God's providential ordering, pre preparation and shaping of what he had at first brought into being. His government and his working out those purposes in and through and upon the creation which he had brought into existence. But either way, God is orderly. He operates according to a plan. And of course, his plan of redemption, of salvation, demonstrates that. It's hatched long ago, even at the fall. Indeed, it was hatched before creation took place. It was his first primal decision. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, even as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. And he works that purpose out in the course of time, methodically, gradually, and purposefully. And it's being worked out now and will be in the future and will come to that consummation which awaits it when Christ returns, just as here in Genesis 1, at the end of this process, God saw that what he had done was good and rested from his labors, contemplating it, viewing it with rightful and intensive joy and delight. God operates orderly. Secondly, God and variety. Each element of the world, as Genesis 1 presents it, is different. Each is created according to its kind. Nothing is exactly the same. There is endless variety. And to test that, I suggest all we need to do is just look around the room here at ourselves. We're all different. We're all humans, but we're all different. The only people who would be exactly the same would be identical twins. But otherwise, we're, we're all different, all different shapes and sizes. Yeah, there's certain similarities in family uh, groups and genetically and so on. Um, I saw on, only uh, the other day that uh, one of my ancestors lived to the age of 106. So, um, well, you never know. Um, some maybe lived about 40 or 50, so that balances it out. But anyway, we're all different. We live different ages, we do different things, we have different interests, different personalities, and so on and so forth. God is a God who loves variety. And that stems from who he is. He is one indivisible being. But he is also the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit 
who are each absolutely comprehensively God, one and indivisible, but yet the Father is not the Son, nor is the Son the Holy Spirit. So in other words, there's unity in di and diversity, and that's reflected in the creation of man, male and female. Not one undifferentiated monad, like some kind of unicellular cellular, um, biological entity, but there's male and female. There are two distinct and different ways of being human, male and female. And we'll discuss next week why there are not uh, 44, 76, or 3,500 different genders uh, on that. God loves di variety, and both unity and diversity are equally important because God is one and he is three in distinct ways. And you can see the way that plays out in human society where there is a stress upon unity in Islamic countries. It has an effect upon the way society operates at every level. And on the other hand, where diversity is proclaimed, as the be-all and end-all and the goal, the opposite dangers will, I, I, I would suggest, <coughs> inevitably arise. Uh, the day stress on diversity at the expense of unity is lead, going to lead and will lead <coughs> to massive problems. God and plurality then. What does this tell us about God? Well, look at verses 1 to 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Verse 3. God said, let there be light. There's God, the Spirit of God, the speech, the word of God. Now, when Genesis was written, there was no clear idea of what person uh, means, you know, even in, in human terms. Indeed, there's not today. It's an elusive idea. Uh, but God, nevertheless, operates and exists and is in this threefold form. And it's clear here, we have the, the kind of Ek pre echo of what the New Testament reveals of God being triune. It's seen particularly too in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image, male and female. There's unity. Man is one, but yet male and female. God is one, yet let us make man in our, unit, uh, in our image. There's self-deliberation, which is unprecedented in the chapter. We remarked this morning that the idea of a, plura, uh, of a plural of majesty, that we are not amused, is, as Queen Victoria remarked, is not, uh, for a variety of syntactical reasons, uh, not um, valid. And God is not there calling upon the angels to participate in the creation of man. Nowhere in the Old or New Testaments are angels said to be involved in creation. It's a reflection of who God is. Indicative of internal distinctions in God. The one God who created the world then is not a solitary, unitary monad. He is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, yet one and indivisible. He is relational, and therefore being relational, he is love. Because love entails and requires relationality. Moreover, look at the way God creates. He creates by direct fiat. Verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. 
He commands and it happens. Verse 9. Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Verse 11. God said, let the earth sprout vegetation and so on. And it was so. Verse 14. Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens. Let there be lights, and it was so. And verse 24, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, and it was so. He speaks, and it's done. He commands, and it comes into effect. Direct fiat. All he has to do is to speak, and it happens. Because God is sovereign, all-powerful, self-existent. He has the right, the authority, the power to effect his will. But Genesis 1 also portrays him as working, laboring, making things. Verse 4, God separated the light from the darkness. Verse 7, God made the expanse and separated the waters under the expanse from the waters above the expanse. Verse 16, God made the two great lights and the stars. God set them in the expanse of the heavens. It portrays him as laboring, as working, not so much by direct fiat, but by operative power and if, uh, effecting of his purpose. Verse 21, so God created the great sea creatures and every living creature. Verse 25, God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock and everything that creeps along the ground. And verse 26, let us make man in our image. And so God created man in his own image. And it portrays in chapter 2 God's creation of mankind, of humankind, by forming them from the dust of the ground and breathing into his nostrils. There's work, there's activity, not simply direct speech. But then thirdly, there's a third way in which God operates, not only by fiat and by work, but by the participation of of the creation itself. Verse 11, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants, fruit trees, each according to their kind. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants, seed, trees bearing fruit. Verse 24, God said let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creeping things, and beasts of the earth. So the earth itself participates in this work. Elements of the earth ministerially cooperate and participate in this formation, which is why this is not the creation, the bringing into existence of the universe, but rather its government, its overall direction, in which God takes into partnership elements of his created order, even as he does with us in the work of the new creation. It is he who brought the new creation in Christ into being through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, through the coming of the Holy Spirit, but he co-opts us as his servants, as his participants in that great work. So then, as three ways of formation of the one plan and purpose of God. So, in other words, the creation is not monochrome, nor are God's purposes monochrome either. He acts in distinct ways. In the beginning, God created. The Spirit of God was brooding over the waters, and God said, let there be light. It's a foretaste, you might say, 
in Israel's own context, a kind of sneak preview of the fuller revelation of God as Trinity as we come to the New Testament. And then thirdly and finally, God and eternity. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created time. He created space. He created all those elements that exist within those uh, bounds. And in John 1, we read, in the beginning, directly reflecting the language of Genesis, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were made through him, and apart from him, nothing was made that was made. All that came into existence, all that was brought into being, was brought into being by the Word, who, John goes on to say, became flesh and lived among us, took our place, lived as man, and is Jesus Christ. See that in John chapter 12, verse, uh, and, and, and other places, 2, Colossians chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1. Throughout the New Testament, there's reference to the participation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in the creation of the universe. Prior to the universe uh, being created, of course, before the foundation of the world, God had determined to create. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together, indivisibly, made that determination, that decision, that decree, that purpose. And it includes, of course, the whole plan, the whole plan of the creation and formation of the human race. It embraces the fall into sin. It includes the providential government of the universe the grace of God too in Jesus Christ coming into this world to save sinners. And the final goal, which is the new creation, uh, things which have, are passing our understanding, what no eye has seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. All considered and included in that great plan and purpose. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is, of course, um, something which should shape our whole thinking, our whole living. The world around us today generally has abandoned any such notion. In turning away from God, it has chosen death because God himself is life itself. In creating the universe, he gave life to created beings, dependent, contingent life, life which, for which we rely upon him moment by moment, which we receive from him, which is in his hands, and which comes from him because he is life itself. Um, it was the great Dutch um, minister, theologian, Herman Bavink, who wrote that apart from the eternal generation of the Son by the Father, creation would not have been possible. It's be God brought life creaturely life into being simply as a free decision, sovereign, no, no compulsion to make that decision, but it rests upon the fact that he is the living God, brimful of vital, dynamic life. And he invites us to participate with him, through him, and in him, 
to become, as Peter says, partakers of the divine nature, to receive life from Christ by the Holy Spirit, and therefore to live, serve joyfully, uninhibited and restrained by sin and by the restrictions of our present mode of existence, but to enjoy life with him forever, to, to love him and to glorify him forever. Those are the great and tremendous privileges and opportunities which we are given. And the creation of, in, of, in Genesis 1 and the creation of humanity too, as an integral and central part of it, points us unmistakably in that direction. A world which rejects God, rejects life, and chooses death. The wages of sin is death, because sin is rebellion against God, who is the author and giver of life. It's therefore a choice for death. And all around us, knowingly or unknowingly, are in fact on that path. So let us pray, praise God and thank him for all that he has given us and pray that we may be partakers of that and that we may be the emissaries, the messengers of life to a struggling and a, effectively a dying world. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, we thank you for your eternal purposes made known in Jesus Christ, your Son. We thank you that you fulfill your plans and carry out your work. We thank you that the end goal of all that you have made is sure to be uh, finalized and completed. We pray that you would help us in our own small area but nonetheless an important one, uh, to look to you for the strength we need to play our small part, which may be a big part, because you are the big God who has great plans. And so we ask that you would be with us in all that we do this coming week and beyond. Strengthen us, we pray. Equip us for your service. Forgive us our sins and grant that we may advance in the knowledge of God, that you would have mercy on those around us and bring about a transformation of our uh, close uh, environment. For we pray this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thou, uh, this is a hymn particularly addressed to Jesus Christ, the Son. Thou art the everlasting word, the Father's only Son. God, manifestly seen and heard, and heaven's beloved one.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.